Now, now we're going to sort of switch gears a little bit because, you know, so far we've been discussing the value of doing small things well and continually improving. But now I'm going to share a story with you of, or perhaps an example with you, of perhaps the worst possible consequences of what happens when things fall apart. I'm talking about one of the worst environmental disasters in US history, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig explosion. Now, this explosion took the lives of 11 workers. It caused more than 3 billion barrels of oil and methane gas to leak into the ocean for 87 straight days. And one of the people that survived this Deepwater Horizon uh, explosion is Caleb Holloway. He, he lost a lot of his crew members that day. And uh, there was a Hollywood movie made about it. You guys might have seen the movie. Uh, the CEO of Safety Culture, Luke Kinnear, watched that movie on an aeroplane. And he was so moved by this story that he had to track down Caleb. He flew him to Australia to meet his Safety Culture team because he wanted the team to learn from the kind of people that have faced the tragedies that all of us seek to avoid. Now, that was quite a few years ago, and since then, Luke and Caleb have remained the best of friends. So in this next segment, I'm going to hand it over the to the two of them to have a chat and share their story. But before I do, ladies and gentlemen, strap yourselves in, because this might be a little bit emotional. This is a backstory about Caleb Holloway. I was on the deep water horizon April the 20th of 2010. I think the horizon incident helped me to realize that I could face some fears and I could do things that some other people may not want to do. And this job that I'm in now, I think it kind of bridged the gap from the brotherhood I had with those guys out there to having a brotherhood here at the fire department. People will always need help. There's always going to be accidents. There's always going to be structure fires. There's always going to be medical calls. And when everybody else is running away or out, we're running in. My kids think I'm a superhero. And when you can get put in that superhero category, doing an occupation that you love, it's amazing. Welcome, Caleb. Uh, it's fantastic to have you here once again. I can see it's uh, still very, very real emotion for you yeah. to uh, see that. It's, um, it, it's an event that uh, I think just about everybody remembers when it happened. But uh, to have you here in person and, and share your experience and, and what you've learned from that as well going forward, uh, and also to just be the person that you are today, it's an incredible privilege for all of us here and for everybody watching online as well to be able to, to hear from you. Well, so thank you. Um, yeah, give thank you. a round of applause for being here. It's awesome. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you, guys. So perhaps, uh, who, who here's uh, seen the movie Deepwater Horizon? Yeah, a lot of people. So um, let's just sort of set the scene a little bit for those that, that haven't. But you were 28 years old. 28. You'd been working for Transocean for about a year or so, is that right? Um, yeah, probably around three years I'd been with Transocean when everything had happened. So. And so how far off the coast are you guys traveling out each day to go to the rig? I'm um, dependent on the well site, but this particular well, we were about 43 miles out. And you, you get out there, you go out in, in helicopters, right? Helicopter. Yeah, yep. and land on top, and then you, you're, how long is your shift? How long are you out there for? Uh, we started 14 days on, 14 off, but then we, uh, we moved to 21 and 21. So we, we were two weeks on, two weeks off, and then we recently had switched to 21 and 21. So three weeks on, three weeks off. And um, I actually liked that change because I had more time with my family at home. So, um, but it was difficult to be away. Yeah, I bet. And so, um, maybe just explain w w what is a drilling rig for people who who are not in the industry. Okay, so um, the the Deepwater Horizon, we were exploratory drilling rig. So what we did, we we were subcontracted out from different companies to go and drill a hole to a certain depth so they could come and test it and then produce that well. So all we were really in charge of doing was getting to a certain depth and making sure the hole was secured, and then we would plug it and abandon it, and then another rig would come in and produce that well if it, if, if it had what they were looking for. Yeah. So, oh. yeah, we were, yeah <laughs> we, were, we were an exploratory drilling rig, so that's what we did. We just drilled the hole, um, 
and made sure it was secure and got out of there and let another rig come and produce it. So and and uh, Deepwater Horizon was the the best and biggest rig ever built in the world. Is that right? Yes, sir. We um, we were top top of the fleet. Um, I had worked for a, a smaller company prior to Transocean, and um, whenever I got whenever I got hired on Transocean and made that transfer from a small company to Transocean, um, just getting out to the horizon because that was my initial rig for my training. That was my first my first assignment. And um, I was on it from the day I started Transocean until the day the catastrophic incident happened. So, um, but to go from the smaller company to the bigger company like that and to see the massive equipment and the high technology equipment they had had compared to what I was used to, it was just mind blowing. Um, so with that being said, um, Transocean was the top of the fleet. Um, and we had the, the highest safety record, actually, um, the, the Horizon did. And everybody, we knew that we had an elite team. We had an elite drilling team. I was on the drill crew. Um, eight of the 11 men that passed away, were they were members of my crew. Um, and the other, the other three men, gentlemen that passed away, uh, crane operator and then two mud engineers. So we were all really close. And... Um, Unfortunately, that night I lost eight really close friends of mine, and um, yeah, it's 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 still pretty tender today. Wow, oh, you can see that, yeah, because you're really literally in the thick of of where all the action was. You're in the, in as part of that that sort of drill shack team, and there was what about another hundred and fifty odd people on the rig all together. Is that right? Yes, sir. It's close. Um, around I think there was around one one thirty or so. If I can't remember they're about approximately one yeah. they're over 100 yeah okay and so um you know, you guys are, are in the thick of it and when you seal off um the hole that, that you put the cement into there's a and, and anyone would remember in the movie but there's a, a negative pressure test that they do to to make sure that there's there's no pressure coming back up right yes and yeah yeah so maybe just explain how that works and so each section that you drill um you have to run casing, which is a, a, a bigger portion of pipe that that keeps the hole from collapsing in on itself, basically. So you drill a section, and then you run casing, and then you pump cement down, and it goes down a, around the casing and secures the casing, and then you drill the next section hole, and it just pro progresses through there until you get to the depth that you want. So there's a, a really big plan in place before you even start. You know exactly what depth you're going to drill to for this section and then you're going to run this much casing and um so i'm sorry what was it what was yeah so so once you like seal that off then yeah. you're doing the negative pressure test to make sure everything's fine mm -hmm. and from that point on it's pretty much you guys are finished right that's the end right, of the right. job um we we pressure test on uh, th when well we test each cement job so um the final one is the most extensive. Um, they do they do several pressure tests on the cement, and and the hole and the formation of the uh, the shell or whatever we're drilling in, and um, the negative pressure test is the final test. So, yeah, we do that. If it comes back good, then we displace the mud and um, plug the hole, like I said, and and we go to the next location that we're subcontract subcontracted out to do. So, and, and like I understand there's some details that are best left for you not to tell in terms of the real nitty gritty stuff, but I can, I can say certain things because yeah. I've seen the movie, so I must be qualified, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, decisions were made. We had, uh, you know, the, the site overall was being, being run by uh, BP and, and the Transocean rig was being leased to them. And so um, the decision was made that it was time to move on and get out of there because I think by that point it was about 43 days overdue from when ideally they wanted to have that delivered and ready. Mm -hmm. So um, once that decision was made and, uh, and, and, and it was like time to, to start getting ready to leave, what happened from there? Well, um, of course, this was our 20th day on the rig so we were we were scheduled to go home the next day my our entire crew were we were scheduled to go home the next day at nine o'clock in the morning so that night we're you know everybody's excited we're wrapping up this well that we'd been having all kinds of um 
not really issues, but it's been a troublesome hole more so than the ones we've done before. And um, it, it was around 30 something thousand foot. So it's, it was a deep well and it, we were excited to be done with it to say the least. <laughs> so um, that last negative pressure test and we were, we were, we were pumped up, the drill crew, my, myself and the guys that were with me on the rig floor, um, we were, thank goodness, we're, we're, we've been on this well for, I think we were around a, a year on that well. Wow. So we'd been doing the, the same location and the same <laughs> with bit trip. The, the formation down that deep, um, when I say bit trip, we have the, the drilling bit on the end of the, uh, end of the drilling uh, line. It would it would wear out really quick, so then because of what you're drilling into, yeah, you're yep. drilling yep. some hard shell, and so we'd have to change the bit, and they would only drill a couple of maybe a hundred foot or something like that, and then have to change the bit. Way back, yeah. So as as floor hands, that was our job. <laughs> We're breaking the pipe down and racking it back, and having to change that bit, and it's thirty six thousand foot of pipe. So <laughs> that makes for a long day, and but it makes for opportunities to be shoulder to shoulder with with guys that we shared personal stories and trusted each other and it was just that I think that's what made us so elite is that we had we had so much common ground even if we we found common ground um you have to get out of your comfort zone we had to get out of I had to get out of my comfort zone to get in someone else's comfort zone to make bonding friendships and stuff and I think over those three years we had done that so much that we it, we were just we were brothers and we trusted each other with everything and that's why we work so well together and uh, you're probably closer than some husband and wives hey? you well, guys spend a lot of time together to spend that much night. time with with <laughs> it's I mean it's half of the year so we're out there half the year with each other and and yeah, it's 12, 16 hour days standing shoulder to shoulder, no matter what the weather is. So yeah, wow. You get pretty close. <laughs> Quite the commitment, yeah. And um, and so uh, at what point you started to notice that, um, I guess things weren't quite right. And, and I think if, if for anyone who's seen the movie, you kind of get a sense on just how significant the cons consequences were after that. But the, the rig, there was, I think, about 15 minutes or so. There was a bit of time passed before it exploded. Like, you guys started to see the, the mud coming up and the gas and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, the lights started burning really bright right. uh, because of the gas. Engine started over-revving. And at that point, people were probably starting to get concerned that something was not right. Yes. And so then the, then the initial explosion happens. And, and where were you then when that happened? Um, at that point, um, when, the, when the explosion went, we... We had already decided. I was, I was the lead floor hand on the rig floor, so I was mentoring one of our new guys, and he had been he had only been up there for that that hitch, so he had been 20 days in, and I was training him to do what I knew to do, and um, so he's basically under my wing for the the first the first hitch, and uh, that was my my responsibility was him, and he was with me. Whenever everything started go to go uh, to go south on us, um, my other crewmates were down in different sections of the rig, working in the pump room and the pit room, and um, so when we did notice that this started to take a turn for the worse, um, it happened so fast. There was almost no time to react. We started noticing some, you know, the mud. They were displacing the mud, but all the pressure that started pushing back, um, some of that was starting to come up onto the rig floor. Well, when we noticed that, I, gra I had um, Dan, who was the new guy, had him with me, and I said, hey, stay over here. We're gonna, I'm gonna go over here to the drill shack, figure out what's going on. Um, and then boom, the, the, the blowout happened. Um, not the explosion, the blowout. So this is when all the gas and the mud's blowing out. And um, Dan, bless his heart, he he reacted really. Um, he he, he kind of lost control, and I probably would have too. But knowing I had the responsibility of him with me, I needed to get him to a safe spot. So had you guys ever prepared for this? Like, was this we, a scenario that that anyone had ever talked through or thought about? 
we we have we do okay. uh, weekly safety drills on on blowouts. So we call them we call them kicks because that's when you get a little bit of gas back, but yeah. not to that extent. Like there's um, when that happened. In my opinion, there was no controlling that. There was no no way you could have shut that off. Mm. Um, with that being said, um, I grabbed Dan and I put him in, uh, showed him to the heavy tool room, and we had phones all over the rig where we could get in touch with certain stations. Um, but it took him and, and told him stand by the phone. I'm gonna go to the drill shack and trying to get to the drill shack. We were already banged up from getting thrown around on the rig floor from the and so I don't know if uh everybody has seen the movie, but they got the blowout scene exactly right. Really? The intensity of Well. Just knocking people out, over. Just it was uh violent. Well. Violent to say the least. Um <coughs> excuse me. And so at that point, like chaos is all breaking out, mm -hmm. and and it was just a matter of trying to figure out where you could be safe. Or, well, I I try to make my way to the drill shack. Uh, the drill shack's right there on the rig floor, kind of, kind of associated where we're at. Um, and as I'm trying to get there, there's the the pressure of the gas and the seawater and the mud coming out of the hole, is ricocheting off of everything. And now the things that everything had the um, pressure had blown up in the derrick is starting to fall down sledgehammers and oh, all man. kinds of stuff that yeah. had been on the rig floor had gotten thrown up in the air. Now it's starting to rain down on you. Rain down along with the cement, I, and I think. And so, um, yeah, at that point, it was like, there's no way I can get to the drill shack. So I have the radio, and I'm trying to get in touch with the driller, my driller, Dewey, Mr. Dewey. And um, I'm getting no response on my radio. So I go back to Dan. At that point, the um, you could feel the gas, like it, it was yeah. starting to yeah. starting to just build on the rig floor, and we were in a in a pretty enclosed space. So I knew that if this thing is was good. to spark off, then we're we're done for here. And so, with um, having Dan with me, I said, okay, I need to get him uh, to the evacuation deck. And I knew where my other guys were. I knew where my other uh, co-workers were so had me get him to the evacuation deck and then there's a, a, a different entrance to down there by the evacuation deck there's an entrance to the middle of the rig the heart of the rig where most of the crew was um, and I'll go in there and do what I can to find them so I get Dan down there to the evacuation deck put a life vest on him say hey, stand by one of these lifeboats and at that point there's nobody there there's nobody at the evacuation deck and this is um, Why not? Because there was still it. It, it had just. Um, I should have said that the the rig had the lights at that point when we were making our way down. The lights got super bright and the engines revved and then it blew. So uh, no explosion. So by the time it knocked us, you know, pretty far into some handrails and busted us up a little bit. But um, we were we were still able to get to where we needed to get, and. Um, out there, when the lights go out, it's completely dark. You can't see, you can't see anything. So, luckily, I had my light. I had a flashlight, and I got Dan after the initial explosion. And now the rig's starting to really catch on fire, um, metal, and so it's burning so hot. It's like a blowtorch in the middle of the rig. So, it's starting to catch everything on fire and there's secondary and um, third explosions going off on the different things getting hot so anyway get him down to the down to the lifeboat and um, at that point there's still nobody down there um, just because it happened so fast in my mind you know I try to play it back and in my mind I felt like it took a long time for it to happen but in reality I think it was so quick that nobody had time to react to it um, so as we're down there on the evacuation deck, I tell him, hey, stay by this boat. I'm going to go in and see if we can locate anybody. And I've been on the rig for three years, and I've been that way a hundred times. When I walked in that door, I couldn't recognize anything. It, wow. the, the explosion had brought things from main deck down into the living quarters, and walls were closed in on themselves. So, And so at some point, did you team up with, with Mike Williams? Did. So he, he started getting people down as well, and then you and him went back, and you, you kept getting more people out. Is that right? 
Yes, and um, there were several, I'd say several, there were a couple of guys that, that didn't get recognized that um, were really heroic that night as well. Uh, Randy Ezel, he was a tool pusher, and um, he was crawling around on his hands and knees, and every time that we would take someone out or try to backboard somebody or just get somebody out, um, you had two lifeboats, and they were almost full at that point. Everybody had that had not jumped off had gotten into the lifeboat because there were people jumping off, and we've got a 60, I think it was a 65-foot air gap. So to the once water. you go over your 65-foot fall down into the salt water that's got burning oil on top of it, so it was um, people were just waking up from being asleep and, you know, realizing what's going on. They're running straight out and jumping overboard. Cause what, what time of the night? It was uh, around 9.30, 10 o'clock. P.M. in the evening. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, so some people were sleeping. Some people were getting ready to go to sleep. Yeah. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different shifts. Um, uh, the drill crew and the, and the crane crew, we, all, we, we change at 11 o'clock uh, in the morning, 11 o'clock at night. Okay. So some are so getting ready, some are going down. But then most of the admin or, or uh, higher-ups, they do the 8 to 5. So most everybody was in bed except for the crews that were fixing to change. And they were, when that happened, they, they didn't realize what was going on outside because we're, it was our home away from home, the rig was. So we had, we had a gym and theater room and everything else. So if you're not actually looking at the derrick and seeing this massive explosion or this massive um, blowout happening, you wouldn't know until the actual explosion. I mean, you could probably hear it, but there's a lot of loud noises on the rig. Sure. So, um, just... Well, wh why do you think you responded the way you did? Like, there's a lot of different ways people could respond, and, and, and you responded the way you did. Like, wh what do you think happened there? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think just knowing that, uh, knowing where our, our guys were, knowing where the drill crew... Um, knowing where Roy was and Adam and um, Shane, they were all down in the pump room and the pit room, and I know that was going to be the closest spot to the engines. And with everything that, when the in when the engines revved, we knew th I knew um, that they were being starved for oxygen. So knew all the gas was getting into the engine somehow, and when it exploded knew that's probably where it came from. So um, knowing that we still had guys <coughs> down in that area where the, where the majority of the explosion took place, cause I think that the explosion, I, I feel like it's happened from the inside out. Um, but knowing they were down there and knowing we still had crew members inside um, was just, it was just you go into survival mode and um, had to get to those guys. You know, I had such deep relationships with them, and, and we're not going to leave anybody behind. Although there's, you know, a ton of people saying, we got to go, dump the lifeboats. And every time that they were going to release the lifeboat, and we were bringing somebody else out. And we're like, hold on, put these guys in, put this guy wow. in, you know. So um, the deeper we got, the more people we found. But at a point there you couldn't get any further in without being trapped or too hot so wow and and i think like uh was it mike uh jumped off the top deck he did as well after the lifeboats had gone and and then he swam to the 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 boat that rescued everybody mm -hmm. that you all went to yep yeah yeah <laughs> he did he 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 i think he jumped off the heliport that was one of the last things cause it was it was kind of off to the side of the rig um and there were some last ditch efforts to get a couple more wounded people off of there and the lifeboats had already dropped. There were some life rafts that were being deployed. Um, as, you, as you saw in the movie, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, he was the last, I think he was one of the last people to jump off of the heliport and he did. Um, it's almost not survivable from that height, yeah. but um, you did. did, and <laughs> yeah, and they. Uh, the good thing was that we had a a, a boat there that were w we were putting supplies on because we were getting ready to move. We were we were breaking everything down and we were getting ready to move. So we had a supply boat there, 
and we're putting stuff on there, getting ready to get in transit for our next site. Well, when the explosion happened, they immediately responded by launching their little uh, John boats, is what yeah. I call them, and they go, they saw people jumping off, so they were picking driving them. around, picking them up out of the water, and that was a huge help Terrific. to see yeah. them yeah. going down there while we're, you know, fighting the battle upstairs. Wow, and and Jim Harrell, I think, that, that affectionately called Mr. Jimmy, uh, he he continued to work in the industry. I think up until he retired, he, you you said he he passed away just I think this May, yeah. uh, he passed away from cancer. But uh, um, he, he continued to stay in the industry. He did. Um, I don't know. I don't think. I don't know if he ever went back to the rig, but he was involved in the industry, um, and I I really I. I love, I love that guy. I love Mr. Jimmy. Um, had a really good relationship with him. Um, and you still speak to his wife? I do. Regularly, right? I talk yeah. to her quite often. Um, and I, I hated that he passed away so recently ago. But um, Mr. Jimmy, he always held the, he, he held a heavy burden on his shoulders that he was responsible ultimately. And it really wasn't. And yeah. it's just, he was, you know, he was in charge and he felt, he felt responsible for that and he held it really close to his heart because we were we were a family out there yeah okay. and um, i always try to talk to him it's not your fault mr jimmy but um well, yeah it's, it's tough and obviously there's lots of lessons the industry as well as taking a lot of lessons out of it overall um, but you personally, in terms of, of the culture, and, and now you're you're you know you're a fireman. You uh, maybe you want to put out all the fires in the world. But uh, you you, you, um, uh, you you've chosen now that field. But what do you value now in terms of culture, and, and how do you think about that? If if uh, if you were to choose the ingredients to make a team work really well, and, and hopefully you know avoid um, things going wrong, what, what what are some of those elements? Um, I think building relationships um like i said earlier you have to you have to be able to get out of your comfort zone um with the guy or ladies or guys that you're around in your in your industry and be able to find some find common ground and um be able to open up to new ideas that say that I've been doing this for 10 years and, and the new guy comes in or the new girl comes in and says, hey, there's an easier way to do that, you know, not immediately shutting that down and saying, I know what I'm doing. Hey, okay, well, maybe there is an open mind and, yeah. and, and taking that and, you know, building, building those relationships and, and companies being able to give you the time to do that um, is, I think that's really, really important to building rapport with with your teammates and um yeah just a few things like that because there's some similarities i imagine working in in um a fire crew like you guys have got to be pretty tight and you got to work together really well so th yeah. there are some some similar traits right there's there's more there's more so like um i have to trust this guy next to me because in in worst case scenario if i go down i need to know that him or her can pull me out of this situation I've gotten myself into um, so yeah being able to being able to trust there's a lot of there's a lot of work you have to put into that relationship you know to be able to 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 fully trust somebody and you know that they're capable with the, the proper training and um, the the knowing your tools and knowing your equipment and not you know, people have to remind me all the time, you know, you have to uh, make sure your equipment's all good. And it's like, well, let me have my coffee first. No, get on it, you know. And, and, that, and I love that. I love that. I, I respect that. Um, and always go, go in with a treat people how you want to be treated attitude to any industry that I'm in or any job that I'm in or any station that I work at. Because however you treat somebody, that's ultimately what you're going to get back. So. Yeah, and you mentioned training. Um, how do you think about that today? And training for, because you know, my experience, um, which is quite different to yours, but still I've seen a lot of different consequences, um, is that you know I think people perceive risk to be low. It's like that's never going to happen to me, or you know we've been doing this for twenty years, like it's just how it is. Um, 
what do you think about training for, for consequences, making people aware of what can go wrong and things like that? Do you see that as, as critical as, as much as training them for best practice and things going right? Where does it, where's the balance there? Um, I think that, that, that definitely helps. Um, you can prepare your mind to react to some sort of chaos to a degree um, until you're in an actual moment where you say, I don't know if I'm going to make it out of this, is that's when the real real reaction, and the better prepared you are, you know, of course, the better outcome is going to be. And so what we try to do with, with training is to just throw some random scenario that's, uh, you know, not, it's not design. we're not designing this training for today. We're not going to let you know that we're doing this. But we're just going to go out. We're going to be driving the streets, and we're going to say, "Oh, we're going to stop on the side of the road. There's a structure fire here. Hook up. Get me. A, get me a line going, and and make somebody think, get caught off guard. You know, try to think on their toes and see how they react. Especially with the with the newer hands, and then they'll do that. Also, they'll do that to me. And I've been there for nine years now, and it keeps me reactive you know it keeps me on my toes so you actually train for learning to be able to make decisions quickly mm -hmm. in the heat of the moment yeah yeah we we try to we try to as best we can and then also me personally i i try to on every call we go to i i will what if something a million times like wow. what if this is going to happen what if this happens what if this happens and um so i'm just it's a step process in my mind. You're thinking through mind. scenarios. Yeah. Um, different scenarios in case this happens. Um, say we go to a fire, you know, what if the roof collapsed? What if, you know, and I'll just play those in my mind on the way to the call. And it's usually three or four minutes before we get there. But um, that's three or four minutes I'm trying to mentally prepare. And best case scenario, we, we go in and knock everything down and get out. Um, but I'm a little bit more prepared and have a contingency plan for if something was to happen. Um, so and I well, try to instill that with the, with all the guys that I work with and I hope they take a little bit away from that. I bet they do. I bet they take a lot more than that as well away from it. And, um, and uh, for those that haven't seen the movie, it's definitely worth watching. It tells an incredible story about what Caleb and, and these guys went through. But how realistic was it? You said the drill shack part was really re quite realistic. But how, how, well, how close did they get it to what actually happened? Um, well, Peter Berg was the director. And um, he's... Because you're involved in, in it I, as well, I did. right? I, yeah. I was fortunate enough. He, he, had, he had reached out to me and um, asked me to consult a little bit on the movie. And... Uh, Mike Williams is the main character, which is played by Mark Wahlberg. Um, but my, what I really wanted to do was to have the, the, the characters that were playing my friends that I lost that night, um, I wanted them to know who they were playing. So it just wasn't going to get Hollywood, yeah. Hollywooded up, I guess you could say. But, um, but when Pete reached out to me, I asked him to make sure to contact the families and make sure it's okay with them before I even got involved. And, and it was still, uh, it was pretty, yeah, it was still a tender subject at the time. Um, and I really didn't want to get involved, um, to be honest, but sure. I'm glad I did. It was a good experience, a very therapeutic experience and really, really kind of an eerie experience because they did make it so real. They made the set almost identical to what they built a, a, they a built scale of the rig right yes they did and it was it when when i went the first time i set foot on it i was just blown away i was just this is wow. my this is this is my old home wow and it's kind of crazy and you know just look for the guys but you know so the movie itself is probably i would say 80 20. okay um, yeah there's a bit of hollywood in there yeah a little bit, bit of hollywood. hollywood but but of course you know it kind I, of I, I remember you said once before uh when we first met you said that uh they, they didn't get the fire big enough like they couldn't create it to really be as big as it was like it's yeah. hard to believe because like it looks like incredible but yeah. people could see that thing way way beyond the horizon hey it was it was massive it was um i i remember being there um after after the, we, we, when we evacuated, we got on the, the Damon Bankston boat um, and we were a mile away from the rig. 
and we, you know, we had already mustered and, and figured out who was, who was on the missing list, and we had to stay there for 24 hours while the Coast Guard did a 24-hour search. And, we, you know, of course, I was there holding hope out that some of the guys had made it off and jumped off, and they're That's still funny. searching. But the amount of heat the thing was putting off um, from a mile away really? was intense. A mile. Was wow. so intense. Wow. But yeah, the, the actual blowout scene, like I said, the, um, in, in the movie, if you'll just take a minute to watch the actual blowout scene, that, that, that was... That's how it was. That's how it was. Incredible. And then it went for uh, 87 days um, and continued to, to spill oil until they finally figured out how to, how to seal it off. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, the massive environmental consequences as well. So yeah. um, let's, let's hope that all the lessons have been taken and it uh, doesn't happen again. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. it, we've got time for uh, a couple of questions as well for people. If anyone wants to ask any questions, you pop up. And if there's uh, anyone online also, if you want to ask Caleb something, you can. And uh, we'll take those um, over the next few minutes while we've uh, got a bit extra time. Um, well, actually, I think we've got one here already. So Excellent. please go ahead. Thank you. I want to thank you for having the courage to be here and sharing your story. I'm Mike Kinney, Safety Culture Strategies. I live here in Vegas. And if it makes any difference for you, I've worked with Chemical Safety Board. I've got went, went through the report. I've talked to some people at MIT. We have a presentation on I've been sharing almost yearly on the management systems that failed, in my humble opinion, set, set you guys up, and you lost some dear friends, and you, it didn't deserve to happen to you. But thank oh. you again for being here. It's an cool. amazing thank story. Thank, thank you. you so much. Appreciate it. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, both uh, Transocean and BP have gone on and become safety culture customers today, Excellent. which is which is fantastic and hopefully helps them avoid uh, anything ever happening again like this. And we're yes. certainly working with anyone that we can to 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 uh, ensure that these things don't happen. Um, um, if we've got, uh, I don't know if we've got anything online. I can't see it if it is, but uh, otherwise, I think. Um, you know, the w one of the things that, that struck with me um, from the moment I met you and, and certainly everyone that, that met you out in Townsville when you came out uh, years back uh, was just the, the person that you are. And uh, when we had um, Captain Sully last year, I, I remember speaking to him um, before our show and I asked him, you know, how much of, of the Captain Sully that we see today was there before he landed on the Hudson and uh, how much was formed after. So same question for you, like how, how much of this incredible person that we see here today is as a result of that and how much was already there because uh, it's, it's pretty amazing to listen to you hear about it. I, I haven't changed. I, I've always been this way. <laughs> I, so. I, I hope I have a likable personality. Um, <laughs> and I think that's why I had really good relationships with everybody on the rig. Um, and in the fire industry, um, always shooting for that, that that next spot, and you know, it is you know I am who I am. That's that's how God made me, and my parents raised me, and my brother out here. And yeah, I, you know. yeah. Your brother Josh has come to join us. Oh, uh, hi, Josh. It's uh, thanks for coming out, and uh, it, it, it's a really really special thing to have you here. Um, when uh, also. Um, when we were chatting last night, you also said it, it, it mean a lot for us to also just pay some respect to your 11 brothers and people that didn't come home that day. So um, we've got, I think there's a, a, some, uh, a clip that uh, was around at the end of the movie that uh, just shows who those people are. So um, I think we're going to run that now if we've got it, and, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Bro. Appreciate it. Thank Incredible, you man. Thank you so much for coming and sharing that. Thanks for having me. Incredible Thank story. You. And... Uh, that's why that's why we do what we do from uh, the minute I, I heard that story it really moved me and uh, it's moved everyone I think that's seen it since and we're going to keep keep telling your story and uh, making sure that people uh, can learn from this yeah. but thank you for being such an amazing human being that you well, are thank you. it's incredible thanks, thanks so for much for having me cheers thank you he is an incredible guy and I think it takes so much courage to come come here and keep talking about possibly the worst thing that's ever happened in your life. Um, I know you're still very emotional and, you, and you're moved by it. As I was watching that interview backstage, Luke, I couldn't help but think, you know his story so well. It's like you know it intimately. You're talking about, you're saying names of the crew members um, and where they were, you know, on the rig at that particular time. 
what was it? But, you know, when you were sitting on that plane, you were watching this movie, what was it that made you decide to track down Caleb and, and how did you find him? Uh, look, I think I was involved in two and a half thousand investigations as a private investigator. Um, I saw every day the consequences of, of people when things didn't go right. And, uh, you know, I was part of a surveillance team and, and would go around and, and see the lives that people lived as a result of this. And, and I, I just... It's the reason we started Safety Culture is, is because I wanted to do something about it. I felt we were part of the problem. We, we waited for things to go wrong, and then on behalf of the insurance companies, we went and investigated the extent of their injuries. And uh, I don't know, I just, it got to a point for me where I just couldn't keep doing that anymore, and I want to be part of the solution. And so um, when I saw that movie, I was like, this is, this is why, mm -hmm. why we do this. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, you know, I got off the flight, I flew from Europe back to Australia and I got off the flight and said, we're going to find Caleb and, uh, and get him to Townsville. We had an all-hands staff meeting in two weeks and one of the challenges we have is, that, you know, we've got, we're a technology company. Um, we're, we're building a, a you know, technology platform and so we've got software engineers that have never worked on an oil rig. They've never done yeah. what Caleb's done. And so uh, I, I need people to be connected to the problem that we're solving emotionally because I believe if you can connect people emotionally to a problem then you, it's a matter of, of getting out of that way they'll feel compelled to do something about it and so when um, when Caleb uh, came to Townsville we played the movie for the team and I said even if you'd seen this before this this version has a different ending mm -hmm. and uh, and at the end there where um, you know the, the 11 people so families and pictures came up, uh, then Caleb walked in and told the story. And uh, the people that were in the room that day, just like I'm sure today, they'll, they'll never, ever forget it. And, um, and, and Luke, I think you raise a really good point. I mean, just, just to backtrack on what you're saying, you know, your team is comprised of tech, tech people, they're software engineers. And I guess as for you as a leader, it was important for them to understand the mission, to buy into the mission. And, and, you know, understand what it's like for people who face the worst possible disasters, the things we all seek to avoid every day, right? Yeah, I wanted them to understand why this matters, why this is important. This is just not another job. Um, I didn't start this to, to be the CEO of a company or to make a lot of money. I did this because I, I cared enough about a problem that I wanted to do something about. And uh, I think that's the difference. And, and that's the type of people that we continue yeah. to attract today. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that we put these sorts of events on for. You know, we, we, uh, we certainly, we don't do it to make money. Uh, and we're not up here selling stuff from the stage or whatever. We're just here to, to inspire people to be extraordinary, to do their best work of their lives each day. And, uh, and I think if it, that's a worthwhile mission. If we, can, yeah. if we can have an impact and help people do that, then, then it's, it's worth us doing so. So why did you bring us all together <laughs> here today? Because it's the middle of a pandemic. I mean, this could have waited. What, what, was, <laughs> what was the mission? What was the urgency? I think we just like uh, logistical <laughs> challenges. We just wanted to come to Vegas, exactly. so let's be honest. <laughs> uh, um, look, I just think it's important that uh, you, a lot of our customers have never met us. Uh, a lot of the people that use our products each day, they download our, our software and they start using it. And so um, for us to be able to, I guess, communicate, you know, and we've got thousands of people who are around the world who are, who are hearing this, but if, if we can communicate, you know, why we're here doing this, what we're doing, and, uh, and, and extend the impact of that, then, then that's why we do it. So um, that's, that's the main thing, just to bring people together. Yeah, and if you guys have any questions in the audience for Luke, I mean, you know, he's the CEO of Safety Culture, he's the reason we're all here. If you want to ask him anything, feel free to go to the microphone. Same thing with our virtual audience, you have an opportunity to, to ask him any questions. Um, one of the things when I was preparing for this event is, you know, it's all about extraordinary stories and, and we've been looking at various levels from CEO of big organisations to, you know, to medium to smaller enterprises. And Luke, when I found out your story, I had to convince you to sit on stage and tell us about it. You, you said you were a private investigator. Tell us about how you came to start Safety Culture and, you know, your own journey, because it is pretty incredible. Yeah, I'd, I'd had a lot of different uh, jobs when I was younger and tried a lot of different things. Most of them didn't work. Most of the things I've done didn't work, actually. And, uh, and you know, I fell into that, that role as a trainee, private investigator, and, and then over seven years ended up managing a team of investigators. And... Uh, 
you know, as I said, I just thought that, that uh, we need to be part of the solution. And so safety culture started out um, really as a, as a training document business to train people on how to work safely. And, um, and that was kind of, I guess, the start of, of the company. And we would provide predominantly just for Australian construction workers um, training uh, technical documents for how to work on a roof and do things like that. And so it was just literally like a, a sheet, yeah, right? And you like check it Microsoft off. Microsoft Word documents, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I thought we could, we could have a bigger impact. And in particular, the compliance uh, mindset, I think, that was, was prevailing. I felt wasn't good enough. I thought compliance was a minimum standard. It wasn't best practice. And that um, the best teams in the world don't wake up and say, hey, everyone, let's be compliant today. <laughs> they wake up to you know, achieve an incredible outcome. And, uh, and, and so uh, you know, a couple of things happened. In 2009, um, a 19-year-old a um, kid, really, by the name of Marcus Wilson, was putting insulation in the roof of a house. And it was a really hot day. It was about 100 and, uh, probably 110 degrees in Fahrenheit, about uh, 42 Celsius. And um, he came down from the roof and he, he died from heat exhaustion. And when the company was investigated by the regulator, they put forward one of our documents and said that the, we trained him, he signed it, and he didn't do, do uh, follow what we taught him. And when I looked at our sales records, they bought that document two days after he died and had then forged his signature on it and said, this is, why we, this is how we were compliant. Mm -hmm. And that event changed my life again. And I thought, you know what? This compliance is not good enough. It's, it's the minimum. So yeah. um, I guess I started thinking then, how do we give people the tools for best practice? How do we give teams you know, the capability to be able to do their best work every day? And uh, it's kind of continued to unfold from there. Yeah, and just so you guys know, it started from his garage. We've got pictures <laughs> to, to, to prove it. Very, very, very <laughs> humble beginnings. Yeah. And uh, you, you know, those are, those are some of the photos. That's actually my brother's old bedroom <laughs> where uh, we're sitting. <laughs> and uh, we moved, that was Alan, our first engineer, and, uh, and Craig, who's there, is still with us. He's, he's there looking at the screen. <laughs> but uh, I'd uh, moved out from the kitchen table after about two weeks, and uh, that's us pretending. I love that you're still wearing a suit. Well, I mean, we that, we that's some serious I think we put that on. Right? We had to take a photo of something <laughs> to probably raise some money or something. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we actually had uh, an investor come because people started using our app all over the world, and we had an investor from Sydney contact us and say, we want to give you guys some money. And, uh, and so he came up, and I didn't know what a venture capitalist was at the time. I'd never been involved in that industry. So I told everyone I had to wear shoes. There was like you know, eight of us. We got a couple of extra friends in the garage. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we put these clocks up on the wall with cities underneath them because we thought we'd look like we're international. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> and so while Rick Baker was talking to us, uh, Tokyo just fell off the wall and smashed <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> and uh, and Rick says, uh, your clock just fell down. I said, that, that's never happened before. <laughs> well, there was some truth in yeah, that. <laughs> and, uh, and meanwhile, they're messaging each other saying, uh, someone grab London. London's about to go down as well. <laughs> And uh, so there was We're trying to look professional here. Yeah, there was this whole show happening in the background uh, while I was trying to, you know, tell this <laughs> Im incredible investor about how great everything was. And uh, was look, he looked at, at the traction we had and the people all around the world that were using our products, the companies. And uh, wow. even though you know back then we were in a garage, uh, it was enough to get the support of some of the best investors in the world. And uh, you know, today we've uh, I think raised like over two hundred million dollars Aussie. So about 140, 50 million US, and uh, it feels like we're just getting started. Yeah, and, and I think it was important to show that, just to show the evolution of the, com uh, the company and where you've come today, yeah. which is now today, Safety Culture app is used by tens of thousands. 55,000 teams. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. 55,000 teams around the world. Now, what's interesting is that because of your position, you actually get a pretty unique insight into um, how these organizations succeed. So what have you learned through that? Well, like I think w our team gets to see the micro behaviors of what great looks like. Uh, and so, you know, we can see if you're a restaurant in New York City and you walk from the back of the house to the front and you do that a couple times a day and you take photos of things and you look at things that we think are important, like the fridge temperatures where the food's being stored. Um, we can look at these behaviors and then start to create uh, a, a picture for what great looks like in that industry. And so, you know, I think over the next 12 months or so, you'll start to see us help 
companies identify what great behavior looks like in, in really at a micro level. And that's the thing that's quite unique about what we've done is you know, insurance companies would look at companies annually and see what they're doing and uh, it, you know, put, make a few inputs and, and away they would go. Um, we're kind of seeing what teams are doing every day and we're able to help them, uh, which is our focus, um, to be better at what they do and understand what works and what doesn't. So. so, Luke, are there some universal truths that you see across these organisations that help us succeed? I mean, I guess we're sort of looking for universal truths with even the speakers we, we've seen and heard today. Yeah, I think we've heard a, a lot taking care of people. You know, I think uh, it starts with that. If, you, if you, you people talk about leadership and, and having teams that can be productive, I think the first thing is to care. And, and take care of people. And uh, if, if you start with that and, uh, and then think about how do we care and take care of our customers, uh, we're in a much better position to be able to do it. So it it's always comes back to those human qualities. Um, but then also having a vision for your team as to what you want to be able to achieve together. People want you know, a clarity. They want a vision on what we're all here to do. And so by, you know, I think having a clear vision, even if it's a, a team within a business, you can still have a vision for what that team's going to achieve. Could be that day, that week, that month, that year. But um, setting that, that vision for everybody to be then be able to work towards it. Simple stuff, but um, a lot of people still don't take time to do it. Right. And, uh, and to talk about, you know, I think what great looks like and, and, you know, training and all that can help, but also what the consequences are when you get it wrong. And that's what, you know, Caleb's story is about and why we, we go to that effort. But um, it's important. We were, uh, um, yeah, we're constantly thinking about, you know, how do we help people tell those stories and amplify, um, you know, the lessons that have happened before. Yeah, is that, I mean, guys, we've only got a couple of minutes, so if you've got any questions, now's your chance. Um, otherwise, I'm going to start wrapping up because we've got uh, Magic Johnson coming uh. soon. Um, but is that why you invest in bringing people together? Why, why you've brought people from all over the world? I mean, we've got an audience of 32, people from 32 countries, 10,000 people. Yeah. What's the reason behind it? Yeah, we did, we did an aviation summit. Um, Bob Butler and the team here in North America did a summit, and it was only about 12 customers came uh, to Kansas City. But there were, they were you know, Canada Air, someone came from the uh, Emirates, uh, I think someone came from British Airways from London. So it was like 12 people from around the world. And what they were able to share with each other was incredible. Like, they were showing each other what they were doing, and then other people were thinking, wow, we don't do any of that stuff. We could be doing so much more. And we saw how people cross-learn. And so we've been you know, doing more of those sorts of events, and we'll continue to build out more of that going forward. But we learn so much from our customers. Um, yeah. you know, we've built this platform that's so flexible that you can use it in any industry, and you can use it uh, you know, to fit any workflow. Uh, and, and so we're constantly learning from people. And I think uh, our customers, bringing them together to teach each other yeah. is actually one of the most powerful things we can do. Well, thank you for doing that. And <laughs> thank you. Hello, we've got a question. Hi. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Alexander. I'm joining you from Austria. Oh, oh wow. Lovely. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you Great to have you with Austria. us. Wow. Um, Congratulations, you've accomplished so much with the iAuditor so far. Great features, issues, for example, excellent feature. So I wonder what's coming up next. Ooh, Great question. My question, you're stealing my question. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. Um, look, we've evolved now from this checklist app to now really a, a platform for teams to be able to do their best work together. So when we think about that, we think about training. How do we help people sh demonstrate what great looks like? How do we continue to improve what they're doing? Um, we start thinking about micro-credentialing, so taking care of all the license and, and, and records for that sort of stuff. We're moving into assets as well. We've, uh, I don't know how we've gone this far without having an assets entity in our platform, but being able to give uh, all of the assets and the, and the tools and the equipment that we use in our workplaces, to give them a home in the platform as well so that you can build the workflow layers out. And I think you're starting to see now some of these workflows coming through with issues and actions, but we're going to turn that up a whole lot more. And um, you know, the, the uh, 70 million checks that are done a month today with iAuditor are all manual. They're people physically going and checking things. So um, that's great because we know it's important enough to go and check. But uh, we can help automate a lot of that. So we'll integrate with more hardware as well with other partners uh, and just find the, the ways that we can help you get the information from your teams, from your assets, from the field. Uh, and then direct it to the right people at the right time so that you can then make better decisions. And so our focus is on you know, the data and the information that those teams need, particularly our customers are really field-based teams, people who are out in the world, not necessarily pinned at a computer all day. 
Um, and so we want to be able to help them distribute that information and then trigger the workflow so that people can respond and make great decisions. So it's kind of general. We've looked at things like uh, your time attendance, rostering, so being able to know uh, who's on site and, uh, and, and make it easy for people to be able to uh, organize their shifts and things like that. So we're just getting started. There is a long way to go, and uh, you'll see all this start to come together over the next couple of years into, into one really cool platform. Thank you. Alexander, thank you for coming you. from Austria, too. Yeah, really thanks so much. It. Great to have you with us. So thanks, thanks for asking the question. Cheers. Do we have another question? Yeah, there's one. Hello. Hi. 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 I, I have a question. Um, I just came from Alaska. Oh, welcome. In a seafood processing uh, plant as a site plant safety manager. And I did all the onboarding, and it gets really boring having the same people come in 40, 50, 60 at a time doing the same thing that with video. I don't know, what's the difference between your, I, I kind of like your approach better than, we use a lot of JJ Keller videos and training things. And I'm not sure if you have looked at that industry in terms of, because it has mechanical, the logout tagouts, everything, all the compliance issues, audits and everything, because we are one of the most heavily audited uh, industry in the world, not just US, yeah. Yeah. Norway's the same thing, See, you know, Australia. Have you looked at that industry at all? Um, you, did you say food processing? Is that what you said? Food manufacturing? Seafood. Seafood, seafood processing. Seafood. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, we have customers that work in that space. Um, we we uh, haven't built specifically for it, but certainly um, you know, the training side of things and onboarding people fundamentally around the world, it's, it's been broken for a long time and uh, people find it you know, not engaging and boring. The retention of information is not there. So you know, that's where micro learning and, and being able to pace content out over a period of time uh, it helps with people. But um, the seafood industry, you know, like we've all seen you know, the world's deadliest catch uh, off Alaska, which is where you've just come from, right? It's, uh, right. it's, it's high risk stuff. So, uh, yeah. And there's a lot of injuries in the industry uh, and injuries that are not reported or underreported. Mm. So in, in terms of when you say orientation, when we do our orientation, we do it everything three hours, and it's, it gets so boring. You have people that are actually nodding off yeah. while you're doing that. That covers everything from food safety to hazardous uh, communication and hazardous, because uh, we deal with refrigeration systems that have uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, huge refrigeration systems that have sure. uh, yeah. uh, hazardous materials in it. So I like the idea of bite size. Have you ever I mean, are you going into that industry and looking into expanding into that industry? Because so that is worldwide. I mean, you have Norway, you have Japan, you have Russia, you have China, you have yeah. US. W whatever we build, we build so that it can be used across all industries. And so um, you know, if there are specifics that you want to see us develop, then let us know. But I know uh, Darren and the team... Uh, you oh, that's yeah. Yeah, I, I, th I think he just put his hand up because he wants to have a chat with you and <laughs> yeah, it, it might be a discussion to, to keep going. Yeah, even yeah Darren's here, yeah. so he, he have a chat with Darren as well. But um, okay. uh, if you can break that content down instead of at one three-hour block, I'd be looking at how we can do that and then measure the retention of the information as well. Well, I mean, I came, yeah. you know, I'm an attorney by training. So I came into that knowing all the regulatory requirements right. and going into safety new. Well, I think that's a great point. I, I, I think if, if we build products for compliance and for regulations, it's going to be boring. Yeah, but it's not just compliance and regulation. I think it's also safety. I mean, a lot Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. Because yeah. there's a lot of accidents and injuries in that industry. Yeah, that but that's my point. I think we've got to look at what best practice is and, and then make sure that that fits onto the regulatory uh, uh, requirements and make sure we're compliant. But let's come up with a vision for what best practice would be. And all of a sudden, the boring stuff isn't what we need to focus on because it's already built into it. And so that's how I think about it. But thank you for your question. Oh, no, that's thank great. you so thank much. You. We'll continue that conversation offline for sure. Do we have what? We've got time for one more, but then I've got to wrap. <laughs> I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, Thank my name's you. Justin, and uh, Hi, Justin. we use Eye Auditor uh, intensely, and we love it, and it's a great product. That's great. I'm, I've got an ask. Is it possible for us to utilize the geofencing and do emergency service location? Basically, where if a crew is deployed and they're out, they're doing an audit, something happens, and they need to reach medical services, drive to direction. We work in very remote locations. 
And so the ask is, can the eye auditor and safety culture help develop a methodology of a database whenever you sign in to a location, you get your geo fencing, and bang, here is emergency service locating capabilities. That's a fantastic idea. Excellent. We should absolutely do that. And uh, I, I think uh, it's something we should start working on. So we'll make sure um, one of the team follows up with you on that and just gets the exact scope on what you need. But uh, I think that's something everyone can benefit from. So yeah, yeah for sure. Thank Brilliant you. question. Love the fact that you guys are interacting and, and getting really specific. Before I let you go, Luke, what's the future of safety culture? Where are you guys headed? Uh, look, we want to reach 100 million people a day with our products. I think that's the opportunity for us. Um, it, it continues to get bigger every day. Um, we want to be a true operations platform for all these teams that are doing this great work in the field. And, and uh, you know, it it's seems like, you know, I think people feel like they're just doing an ordinary job every day. But it's it's truly extraordinary what we are able to do. And, uh, and we want to continue to fuel that for people all around the world. So... We're working day and night to make it happen, and we've got a long way to go. It feels like we're just getting started. Oh, I love that. Thank you so <laughs> much, Thanks, Luke. Cheers. Great having a Thank chat. You. We can Thank dance. you. We can dance. Everything's out of control. We can dance. All right, guys, I was checking my watch because I heard in my ear that uh, Magic Johnson might have arrived. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is we're going to let you guys have a, have a coffee break. You're going to have about 20 minutes. And then back here at 4.30 p.m. sharp so we can have the final guest speaker of the day. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys really soon.